morning, everybody. Thank you for waiting. I am Chiaki Mukai from Japanese Space Agency, your moderator of this highlight lecture. I flew in space two times. When I first see, saw our home planet, I was amazed and stunned by the beauty of the blue planet. But by watching from space closely, carefully, we can observe that Earth is endangered. Across the planet, there are cha challenges. One of the planet's uh, premier natural features, the Great Barrier Reef here in Australia, is one of the endangered. Coral bleaching is happening. This session <coughs> will learn about what is happening in our home planet. Dr. Paul Hardesty, the chief executive officer of the Australian Institute of Marine Science, will tell us about the story. And during uh, his presentation, if you folks have some questions, please write our questions and then bring the questions to, uh, to, the, to the, the people uh, helping uh, for this uh, uh, lecture to save time so that we can get many questions as possible to Paul. So Paul, Dr. Hardesty, now you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. Um, thanks very much, everybody. And thanks for coming and sticking around uh, for the evening. And thank you, Chiaki. Uh, look, uh, you're a hero. Uh, when I was a young boy, I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to go into space. Didn't quite work out that way. But uh, I've got a pretty good uh, second best gig doing that kind of stuff on the home planet. I'm going to be speaking to you over the next few minutes as a user of the technology that all of you are here uh, to talk about during this conference. And as I go through my talk, hopefully you'll see that, yeah, as Chucky pointed out, we, we, have, we have some challenges. And frankly, we need your help. A little bit of a background then in my talk, the Great Barrier Reef, assessing its health from space. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the background of the reef, what's uh, the history. Uh, what is the reef? Where is it? Why is it important? I'll give you a bit of an overview of the health of the reef. Uh, it's made international news recently. You may have heard about it. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the impacts and challenges in the water and on the land that are affecting the reef. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're using space-based technologies to help us in our, in our work. Uh, to, uh, to understand the reef, to understand how it works, and to understand how we can protect it better. And then I've been asked to give you a little bit of a prognosis for the future, which I, which I will do. Now, uh, I was told that there would be a computer here at the front that I could actually manipulate the, uh, the video, but uh, that's not what's going to happen here. So what I'm going to do is start with a bit of a video for you, and here it is. So if anyone's been lucky enough to go to the Barrier Reef or reefs around the world, if you've been lucky enough to go snorkeling or scuba diving and get under the water, you know how incredibly beautiful these places can be. How diverse the life is. How it challenges our own humanity to understand what we have here on Earth. And of course, millions of people from around the world come to enjoy these places and to reflect and understand, in a way, their own humanity and how we're connected to the rest of life on the planet. In the next five weeks, sometime around the first full moon in November, a little miracle is going to happen up on the Great Barrier Reef. All the living coral will spawn simultaneously over a period of about five days. This is just some of our footage of that kind of event. And some of them will land on some hard substrates like these little guys, and they'll start growing into new corals, new coral polyps. 
And so it's really just to emphasize that the Great Barrier Reef and all coral reefs are living, breathing organisms that grace our planet. Nice relaxing music, the piano kind of puts me to sleep a little bit. So anyway, time to wake up and get back to the talk. So these are all reasons why the Great Barrier Reef is a World Heritage Site. I'm just going to orient you a little bit. Uh, I was told that I would have a laser pointer, so if there's anyone uh, who's handy and wants to hand me a laser pointer, that would be great. But the Great Barrier Reef sits up there on the north eastern part of the country. It's about 2,300 kilometers long, covers over 340,000 square kilometers. So it's the size of Japan, or Germany, or Indonesia. It's home to over 3,000 species, or sorry, 3,000 co individual coral reefs, some of them tens of kilometers, square kilometers in size. There's 600 islands of different shapes and sizes. It's home to over 1,600 species of fish, dozens of species of shark and ray, and hundreds of types of hard and soft coral. It's a breeding area for humpback whales. There's turtles, there's dugongs. Oh, thank you, mate, good on you. Seabirds. Many of these creatures that exist in the reef are actually endangered in many other parts of the world. So it's a pretty special place. And last but not least, it's of profound significance to Australia's Aboriginal and Indigenous communities. And their relationship with the reef goes back millennia, thousands of years. So I'm trying to give you a sense of time here because the reef is actually incredibly old. Uh, it certainly predates our appearance on this planet in our current form as, as uh, upright hominids. But uh, it's at least 500,000 years old, half a million years old. It's been around a long time, and as I go through my talk, just bear that in mind. Bear that in mind that it's been around a long time, growing, living, uh, continuing, to, continuing to evolve. And so, recognizing a lot of this value and the, and the beauty of this place, and the special significance it holds for Australians in our national psyche, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park was established by an act of parliament in 1975. So, you know, a long time ago. I was just young then. That followed pretty quickly. Five years later, 1980, it became a World Heritage Site. And throughout the following years and decades, the park was expanded, uh, new management and zoning plans came in to the point where today, as we stand, almost the entire Great Barrier Reef is protected and is part of this, uh, this Great Barrier Reef Marine Park area. It supports many uses, so it's a mixed use area, huge in scale, there's fishing and tourism and recreation. And as I said, it's also become and is part, a key part of the Australian national psyche, an iconic part of our identity. And as you'd expect, because of all of this, it has huge value. It has huge economic value. A recent study by Deloitte Access Economics estimated that the reef supports 64,000 jobs and contributes over $6 billion to Australia's annual economy, or to our economy each year. Over two million people a year visit the reef, and using a very traditional financial approach, the economists involved in this study came up with an asset value, a present value of, of about 56 billion dollars, which seems like a lot, but uh, actually when you look at broader estimates of value, particularly around ecosystem services, so the services that, that living functioning reefs provide to humanity in every given year, uh, this pales in comparison. So using United Nations Environment program guidelines for the value of coral reefs and seagrass and mangrove habitats, which range in the order, I'll give you a median number, of around a million dollars US per square kilometer per year 
that these living features exist and deliver value. You can readily calculate a 30-year net present value with a reasonable social discount rate of the value of the reef in the trillions of dollars. But then you can also think, well, what's the replacement cost of this? If we lost it, if it disappeared, what would it cost us to recreate something like the Great Barrier Reef? Well, I'll leave that to your own imagination. It would be incredibly difficult. It would take a long time. And I don't think there would be nearly enough money to do it. So this notion of value can be looked at from many, many different perspectives. And because it's so valuable, we monitor its health, just like we monitor our own health as individuals and our families who we care about. So we monitor the health of the reef. And for the past 32 years, the Australian Institute of Marine Science, which is Australia's national marine science agency, in collaboration with many partners, many of whom I will mention today through this talk, have been monitoring the reef, monitoring its health. And for a long, and for right from the beginning, we've used very traditional methods such as this, putting a diver in the water and pulling them behind a boat and allowing the divers who are expert marine scientists to examine the coral, examine the reefs, and, and make, uh, make determinations of their health. And to give you an example, in this last go-round, our 2016 and 17 monitoring programs, we went to 74 of the hundreds of reefs on, on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we towed our divers over 600 kilometers, and we were at sea for over, over three months doing the work. So it's a pretty labor-intensive effort. We also use our network of permanent reef-based weather stations. Uh, there's a photograph of one here. You can see it there just uh, sticking up. Oh, now that I have this, I can use it. Uh, I would if I could, if it worked. Ah, yes, there we go. There it is, sticking up in the reef. And these provide uh, data on such things as air and sea temperatures, currents, uh, and uh, air, air pressure and so on. And this data is fed back to our data center and is publicly available online. So we use that. And we also use our Australia's integrated marine observation system, which couples in-ocean uh, measurement devices and satellite imagery of different types to, to uh, combine to create an integrated picture of Australia's marine and coastal environments. And so here you have a plot from, actually it's from March in 2016, which will be a date that uh, I'll mention here a couple of times over the next few minutes. And you can see that there's current information here, there's sea level information, and most importantly in the colored uh, grading, there is uh, temperature information. And if I zero in on one corner of this here, this is the northern section of the Great Barrier Reef here. In here, what you will see is that you've got some pretty high temperatures starting to accumulate here uh, in the northern part of the reef. So again, this is some of the information that we use um, on a regular basis to monitor the reef. We use satellites increasingly and pretty extensively. So this is just a list of some of the parameters and some of the properties that we will, on a routine basis, use satellite information to, um, to include in our in our reef monitoring appraisals. So temperature, salinity, ocean color, currents, uh, sea level, and so on. This also allows us to make use of a number of products that have been made available uh, to help us in monitoring the reef, and also in a predictive capacity. This shows a uh, couple of panels from uh, NOAA's, from the United States, NOAA's Coral Reef Watch Program, and my colleagues from NOAA here in the front who've, uh, who've been so kind as to invite me here to this, uh, this uh, event today. Thank you very much. But you can see here a couple of panels that are um, of, of interest. Uh, this one actually is uh, degree heating weeks 
and as you get out to about 10, so corals after about one, if they have an elevated temperature above their uh, comfort zone of one degree for more than a month, they tend to get uh, pretty upset and uh, I'll come to that in a minute, but they don't like it very much and they start to, to, uh, to suffer pretty significantly. And so you can see here anything that's sort of red and, and these darker colors is, is not particularly good. But you can see here in the north of, Queens, in the north of Queensland, the northern part of the reef, uh, you've got a, um, a product here on degree heating weeks that's showing a, a, a patch of concern up here in the north. And this is a 2017. Uh, March of 2017 plot. This is just degrees uh, from uh, a datum, from a, an average datum. And you can see here in the central part of the reef, uh, an area of concern where the water's getting pretty hot. Now I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but right now I'm just trying to give you a feeling for the types of products and the types of things that we use to monitor the reef. Another homegrown product that's been produced by the Bureau of Meteorology, another, another one of our close partners here. Uh, in Australia, it's called Reef Temp Next Generation, and it does what it says, reef temperatures. And it's a high resolution system that works with our um, e-reefs program that we developed with CSIRO, which is the National Science Agency of Australia, uh, to again, allow us to get some really strong detail and information on what's happening in the water around, around the, the Great Barrier Reef. Now, I'm just uh, going to uh, do two things now. I'm going to go get some water. I had actually poured myself a glass, but it's disappeared. There's a very efficient group of people here uh, that uh, clean up before you've even finished. <laughs> and I'm also going to come down here and have a look at what our lovely artist is doing in terms of, uh, OK, is that what I'm saying? Yeah, pretty cool. We have some challenges. We need your help. It's pretty cool. Thanks. Very good. So, all this monitoring that we're doing is showing that yes indeed, human beings are having an impact on the health of the Great Barrier Reef. And these impacts are coming from a lot of different sources. Some of them are natural, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Many of them are man-made. Here's a list of human-induced stresses on the reef that we're concerned about. At the top of the list, on the left, high impact is anthropogenic climate change. There's also land-based runoff, commercial and recreational fishing, coastal development, the opening up and dredging of port complexes, recreational fishing and boating, and so on. And as you go down the list, they get less severe, if you will. And I'm gonna try to talk to you a few, about a few of those in, in a little bit more detail. The first I'd like to mention is natural. So this part of the, um, the coast of, of Australia is subject to cyclones. And what this slide shows is the track of 10 category three or higher tropical cyclones that have battered the Queensland coast between 2005 and 2017. The most recent was Cyclone Debbie that hit earlier this year. And you can, just, you can see that those things are coming in at different angles and different locations and they're hitting the coast on a pretty regular basis. Cyclones impact the reef in two ways. The first is the primary impact from the energy and the wave motion of the cyclone itself, damaging the phys physically damaging the corals. And the secondary impact occurs after the cyclone hits land, torrential downpours, that rain lands on the, on the, in the terrestrial environment and then runs off into the reef, carrying a number of um, compounds and so on that the reef doesn't particularly like. And I'll just talk about those in a bit, a bit of detail here. So this primary impact is, is pretty, can be pretty devastating. So these are before and after photographs along the same transect at Double Cone Island Reef in the Whitsunday Islands, if you've ever been up there, beautiful place. And you can see the effect of Cyclone Debbie. So this is very recent. It just literally smashes the coral and flings it all over the place. And notice also that the water becomes very turbid. Now corals need clear, clear water because they use light for their photosynthesis to survive. So it's pretty devastating that way. What I'd also like to do is to run a little bit of a video here for you. Um, cue video, guys in the back. 
this is our e-reef system, and uh, it um, allows us to model the uh, temperature, wind speed, salinity, and current, in this case, as Cyclone Debbie approaches. And if you look at that second panel, there it is. You can see the eye of the storm come and hit the coastline. If I ask them to run it again, please, and you keep your eye on salinity here, you can see right after the cyclone hits, watch the pulses of red, which is fresh water coming out here. You see that? So that's the rain being dumped on the land and then the runoff hitting the reef. Oh, they're running it again, fantastic. Third time. It is pretty cool. Okay. And so what that runoff does is it carries fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides that are used extensively in the agricultural areas that lie along the reef that runs off into creeks and gullies and eventually makes its way to the coast. And you get these big plumes of sediment and, and, and these chemicals that are carried out to the reef. And, many, and the sediment and the chemicals are deleterious to the health of the corals. And uh, often you can see that sedimentation covers corals. That can cause problems. The turbidity of water causes problems because the light doesn't get through. And also these chemicals can, and nutrients in particular, can change the water chemistry and therefore the biology that, uh, that surrounds the reef. And one of the things that can happen is that nutrients can trigger outbreaks of these ugly beasties here, crown of thorns starfish. These starfish are, uh, are particularly nasty uh, in terms of the health of the reef. I'll just skip this one. So basically what happens is that we believe that increased nutrients allow these crowns of storm starfish larvae to survive better, and you get these mass outbreaks. Here they are. They literally eat the coral. They suck the living tissue out of the, the uh, calcareous skeleton structure and then they move on. And uh, they're devastating. And so what we've actually resorted to in many parts of the reefs is we're putting divers down. They're stabbing the individual starfish, uh, injecting them with ox bile, which is uh, toxic to them, and, and killing them. But you can imagine, this is incredibly labor intensive and time intensive, and there's just no way we could do it for the whole reef. So really, what this is, this is occurring on high value tourist reefs so that the tourist operators can continue to bring divers and snorkelers and, and, and people out to see the reef and that the reef isn't, hasn't been completely destroyed by, by crown of thorn starfish. Now this is a very short video, but again, I'll ask the guys in the back to just keep cueing this while I talk and just keep cueing it over and over. It's pretty short. I'd like to now talk about the effect of warming water, global warming, on coral. In, a very, in very simplistic terms, coral lives because of a symbiotic relationship between the coral structure, which is the hard uh, physical structure that you can see, and a symbiont, which is basically an algae that lives inside the coral and provides it with most of its energy. And it's what engages in respiration. And on the left, you have a healthy, colorful coral polyp here. And on the left, on the right, sorry, you've got a bleached one. So the temperature has been elevated for too long, and what happens when that, when that occurs is that the algae is ejected. It leaves the coral. And after a couple of weeks, if the, if the polyp, if, sorry, if the algae doesn't return, then the coral dies. They both die. They need each other to survive. It's a symbiotic relationship in the purest sense. Thanks, guys, for that. And what you have left over is this ghostly, almost haunting, if you've gone underwater and seen it, remnant dead coral skeleton. And it's so pure because it's pure calcite. So it's like the Taj Mahal, if you've ever seen that. It's just pure calcite, and the light shines right through it. And it's, it's haunting. Unfortunately, very quickly, what also happens is that after a couple of weeks, uh, Algae starts to just live on the outside of the coral structure. It starts to decay, fall over, and die. And what you have left is just something that looks like uh, a green, mat soupy mess, really. So it's, it's not a pretty sight. 
I'm going to give you a little bit of information now about what's happening on the reef in terms of uh, the long-term condition. So what I'll, like, what I'll show you first is a 27-year encapsulation of reef monitoring from 1985 to 2012. And during that time, what we saw was, if you look at this graph of coral cover here, coral cover and percentage, and the years here, is you saw basically that over that period, we've had a very significant decline in coral cover. And over that 27, per 27 year period, we estimate we lost around half of the coral cover in the Great Barrier Reef. Now during that time, we were also able to, un to understand the causes of this. And so we did a bit of work to attribute what were the major reasons why we lost half the coral cover during that period. And what we found that were, there were a couple of major cyclones that hit, and just under half of the damage was because of cyclones, the kind of thing that the pictures I showed you earlier. These crown of thorns starfish, we call them cots, outbreaks, another 42%, so pretty significant. And during that time, we had two bleaching events, one in 1998 associated with the El Nino, and one in 2002 also associated with a global period of warming, uh, warming waters in the oceans. And we, we assessed that the coral bleaching was responsible for about 10% of the mortality. One of the things we also knew and could see very clearly was that this loss of coral was not uniform across the Great Barrier Reef. So we typically divide it into the northern third, the middle third, and the lower third here. Again, 2,300 kilometers along this length. But what we really found was that the north, where there's actually not nearly as much agricultural development, it's very remote, much, many fewer people go there. So it's really been, over that period, almost pristine. And you can see here that the coral cover loss in the north was almost zero. So really, over that time, there was ups and downs. But really, it was very, very healthy. If you wanted to ever see the most beautiful, pres best preserved parts of the reef, that's where you would go. The middle suffered, again, a pretty significant decline, but it was really in the south where you saw a precipitous decline over the latter years of that, of that period of investigation. Now you can imagine in 2012, after this all came out, there was a lot of consternation around Australia. This is, this is not good. You know, we've lost half of the, half of the, the reef. And so one of the things that happened was that the government of Australia and the government of Queensland got together with stakeholders from across the spectrum, from industry to uh, the, uh, the, the philanthropists and the NGOs, and a, a joint Reef 2050 plan was developed, a long-term sustainability plan for the reef. And the vision was to maintain the reef's iconic value, not only for Australia, but for the planet. And it was really a 35-year blueprint to manage the reef, and the goal was to, to keep it at, at least as good as it is now, and hopefully to make it a lot better over that 35-year plan. And there were hundred, hundreds of actions, 139 actions, set targets and outcomes around ecosystem health and biodiversity, heritage, water quality, and so on. So very, very comprehensive. But in the last little while, um, Something's happened. I'm going to again uh, come back to my friends, our friends at NOAA, to uh, to show a little bit. Uh, here, this is another video. So, if I can ask the gentleman in the back to start running the video, please. I'll just quickly orient you. This is um, these are bleaching forecasts. So, NOAA has a product, and you'll see it get more and more detailed as the years go on. That really tries to assess whether or not these heating degree weeks conditions for coral bleaching are going to occur or not. And you can see here that as time goes on, uh, there's a couple of areas where it was pretty hot. 2009 didn't look pretty good. And I'll just let it run forward. 2016 and 17. Now, here's the key here. So the purples and the browns and the hots, total bleaching, extensive mortality, you can read it. And so what this predictive tool showed was that, um, indeed, we're getting more frequent episodes of very, very warm waters around the, around the, around the reef. 
And indeed, when we look at these two graphs of 2016 and 2017, again, degree heating weeks, heat accumulation, you can see a couple of things. Number one, in 2016, the northern part of the reef right along here, remember, historically, the, by far the best preserved and most, uh, most beautiful part of the reef was severely impacted by sustained heating. And then in 2016, you got almost a, a mirror image of this, except one big difference is you can see here along the coast in the middle third, here it stayed cool. That heating now really came right up to the shore in these shore reefs. And so these two events really have been a game changer in Australia. So in the past couple of years, uh, and this is data from James Cook University, and a very well-known gentleman in coral reef surfaces, uh, circles, Terry Hughes, went out and did aerial surveys of, relf, of, of bleaching. And what we've basically found is the following, was that in the 2016 event, the northern reefs, wherever you see a red dot, you got greater than 60% bleaching. And the blue dots are less than 10%, 10% or less. You got extensive bleaching all along the northern section of the reef. And then the very next year, this has never happened before ever that we can record in history, and our records go back using coral cores hundreds and th or thousands of years. And we cannot, we have never seen uh, bleaching before 1998, and we've never seen back-to-back -back bleaching. But then in 2016, we got this bleaching, and the middle third of the reef now, significant damage and significant bleaching here. Note that there's a lot of blue dots up here. What that actually means is that there was so little coral left after the first bleaching, never had time to recover, that the second bleaching just kept knocking out whatever was left. And the, uh, I was talking to Terry a couple of weeks ago, and the net effect of this is that in the northern part of the reef, we've lost over 80% of the reef in a period of less than two years. This part of the reef, we've lost about half. And currently, the southern part remains in reasonable shape. But remember, the baseline is the previous information I showed you, that 27-year period. That was the baseline, where we'd slowly lost half of it to cyclones and runoff and so on. So the plain fact of the matter is, is that we're not in a particularly happy place at the moment. So how do we use satellite and space technology? And I'll stunned you all into, uh, into disbelief, but hopefully uh, by the end we'll be all motivated. Because can we see bleaching from satellites? How can, sp how can space technology help us? Well, in, in so many ways it can. This is some work, again, done by some of our colleagues at NOAA, um, uh, John Headley in, in particular, just trying to say, can we use visual images to see whether or not bleaching has occurred, rather than trying to go out using planes and helicopters and divers in the water, which is all very time consuming and not an exact science. But you can see here that reefs, when they're healthy, are dark. The algae are dark and colorful, and that comes through as these dark spots here. Hopefully everyone can see it. There's a lot of people up at the back. Hopefully you can see it, guys. Here you can see, after the February 2017 bleaching, you can see the white here. This is the same reef, and you can clearly see that brighter white. And if you come down to a far smaller or higher resolution here with these pixels, you can see the dark pixels, and you can clearly see those ghostly white pixels. So as our resolution gets better, that's one of the challenges to everybody. We need better resolution on the data that we get from satellites, and we need it pretty urgently to help us understand what's going on. But one of the things, one of the challenges that uh, I'll throw out there that we don't know yet is that using hyperspectral reflectance in particular, we can certainly tell where, where coral is bleached, so where the symbionts have left and it's bright white. But as I said before, we can't really tell if it's going to die or recover. Because as soon as it recovers, if the symbionts come back in, then the reef regains its color and it looks that darker color. If it continues to be dead and the symbionts don't come back and it's covered in that yucky turf algae and you're swimming around, it's algae. Same reflectance, same color. So at the moment, we're having a real problem in distinguishing those two. If we could do it, it would help us tremendously in understanding how reefs recover, under what conditions they recover, 
and what we can do to help them recover. The other thing that I'd like to stress is that the Great Barrier Reef is not alone. This same thing that I've described is happening at reefs around the world. They are all subject to the same issue, the same warming issue. Uh, we had the, um, uh, one of the senior members of a delegation from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, their marine uh, division, visiting us down in towns, up in Townsville uh, a couple weeks ago. And I asked them about the, the state of their reefs, and they said they're probably worse. Uh, the Caribbean is suffering. So this is a global issue. And whatever we do here, we're hoping can help uh, reefs around the world. The scary thing is, is that business as usual climate projections, so if we keep emitting greenhouse gases the way we are, the predictions from the people who know are that these severe bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef and elsewhere will become annual events by 2030. Coral reefs need years, decades to recover. We know that. And, um, yeah, that's just not going to be a particularly happy place. So there's some real urgency about, around everything we're doing. So we're trying to manage large and complex ecosystems here. So we need to observe, identify change. We need to model those changes and to complete accurate forecasts. Satellite and space-based technology can help us with all of that. We need to do it globally. We need to do it regionally. And we need to do it locally. Only that way can we develop the kinds of solutions that are available potentially to help manage and help preserve coral reefs into the future. So I'm going to talk really quickly now, if I could, just about some of the things that we need and how space technology can help us. We need to be able to clearly see the bottom. We need to circumvent the impacts of clouds, which are really prevalent in our tropical uh, latitudes. We need the better, better resolution, which I've talked about. And we need to be able to see not just biodiversity, uh, we need to see biodiversity and its state, not just the general environment. So we need to be able to pick out individual features, corals and fish and so on. And we need to be able to forecast better, faster, sooner, and further into the future. So what we're really starting to talk about with many of our collaborators is this idea of multi-layer platforms, and that these cover from the base of the sea all the way up to the surface, up into, up into, up into the uh, high altitudes and then into space. So currently we're, we're working, as many organizations are, on remote operated vehicles that can operate at depths to allow us to monitor what's going on underwater. We've been working recently with Boeing and Liquid Robotics on their Wave Glider, which is a, basically an autonomous surface vessel. It's about a surfboard size, and it, it, uh, it tracks along the surface and can carry various pay payloads of instrumentation that we use. We've, we've been experimenting with, uh, with drones. I'll talk about that a little bit. And of course, various types of satellites and um, medium altitude uh, systems like uh, Boeing Scan Eagle. So we need to use all of that information, couple that with our in-diver, in-the-water, human-based information, and, and really bring this together to provide all of the, you know, the hitting power and the thought that we can to this issue. Uh, this is just a quick slide of, uh, of NASA's uh, CORAL initiative, which is really about uh, starting to try to think about using hyperspectral imagery to help us understand the reef and distinguishing between live coral, algae, seagrass, sand, and so on. We also want to, um, we're also deploying drones, as I said, with hyperspectral cameras. This is a, some work we did with Queensland University of Technology. And we also put, and we are putting hyperspectral devices down into the water to provide calibration and validation uh, for for the uh, out of water systems. And really, if you can just cue the uh, video here, this is just a video that, uh, of, of temperature. And it just shows that with, with increased resolution, 
we get a better insight into what's going on in the reef. In this particular, um, this is during the 2017 bleaching event, sorry, 16, you can see here the appearance of a little area of upwelling in cold water that shows up. We never knew that was there until we got this better imagery and, and better resolution. And of course, that corresponded directly with observations in the field that reefs there on the Taurus Island didn't bleach. And so now we can start to understand why is it upwelling and their hydrothermal current, hydrodynamic gradients and so on that, that, uh, that we can use to better understand that. So resolution is incredibly important. So what's the final piece for the spectral reef dream for, uh, for Australia? We like to think of, uh, we're, we're sort of talking up an idea called ReefSat that maybe we can get a small uh, CubeSat into space at some point that's dedicated to monitoring the Great Barrier Reef and helping us with our challenges. Just wanted to mention too that high return rate, again this is another video gentlemen, the high return rate can uh, overcome the, uh, the issue of clouds. It's, it is a big issue for us, uh, to, particularly during the tropics when there's a lot going on up there in terms of heating and, and uh, that's, that's when we really get our, our uh, our outbreaks of, uh, of, of high temperatures in the waters. And being able to see through these clouds it is, is an issue. And so that's a challenge for us as well. As I said, the Great Barrier Reef, we're not alone. We believe that we have the opportunity to be a model for the world, not only in how we protect it and how we use uh, policy and science to help protect the reef, but as a model for how to manage these things. And so the kind of technologies that, that you guys develop and that we need can be used at really significant large marine protected areas around the globe. They're remote, huge in scale, they're incredibly valuable, and they need to be studied and understood so that we can manage them better. I'm gonna end up now with a really quick few slides on the prognosis and what we're trying to do about it. I've already mentioned that uh, corals in a warmer world, they're not happy. They really have few choices. They're not particularly ambulatory creatures. They're static. They can move, they can adapt, or they can die. And basically, ladies and gentlemen, uh, not to be a harbinger of doom because I'm an eternal optimist. Anyone who knows me will, will, will understands that, but we are running out of time. You know, we used to talk about these kinds of climate issues as, yeah, in the next 10 years we need to make progress, in the next couple of decades we need to progress, in, in the next generation we need to make progress. Now these coral reefs are among the most sensitive creatures on the planet to temperature. They got nowhere else to go when the temperature rises and they are literally there telling us that um, they're dying. And, and so we're out of time. We have to start acting now. The pressure on the GBR will not ease. The global climate and ocean acidification issues aren't going away. The local issues aren't going away with increased population and growing economies. So we can't sit around as, as an agency like the one I lead, the one I have the great honor to lead, by the way, and, and just monitor the decline. We have to start taking action now in any way we can uh, it, it, with the things that we can control. And so we're now extensively starting to promote science that is going to help the coral recover and adapt to the new conditions. So really future-proofing coral reefs to the degree that we can. So can we enhance natural processes of recovery and resilience? Can we restore lost corals at reef scale by using a variety of techniques that I don't have time to go into anymore? Can we uh, reduce the exposure, exposure of corals to heat, to heat events, geoengineering, uh, re, uh, pumping cold water onto reefs and so on? All of these, as you can imagine, uh, are, are pretty difficult. And can we speed up the thermal adaptation of corals using uh, new genetic technologies, for instance, to breed the next generation of super coral that are heat tolerant? by splicing in heat tolerant genes from the Red Sea and so on. All these things are being investigated now because we really, we have to. So I'll make a few concluding remarks and then I'll pass it back. The Great Barrier Reef and reefs worldwide, I'd like to characterize them as battered, bruised, but still beautiful and incredibly valuable. There are multiple stressors that are driving coral mortality worldwide and I've mentioned a few of them. We need to continue and, and rely more and more heavily on space-based 
uh, and aerial platforms to help us get the information we need faster, cheaper, and better. And we need predictive tools so that we can do our best here. Increased resolution is, is, a, is critical. As I mentioned, without significant global action on climate change, the future of reefs is pretty difficult. And it's pretty hard to talk to school children about this, by the way. So we're starting at, at organizations like mine, we're starting to work now on restoring, uh, on adaptations for res restoration and adaptation because time, time is running, the clock's ticking right now. So thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for coming along tonight. And I'm re really happy to answer questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. That was wonderful. And I am sorting a lot of questions, actually. <laughs> well, uh, we are sorting the questions, and the first one maybe just uh, talks about the phenomena, and I actually, we, we combined the questions. Then uh, during the 1990 and the 1995, there's an increase of the uh, coverage of the coral reef. What's happened? Yeah, so corals are, uh, I showed you that little uh, video of, yeah, no, I think you can hear me fine, yeah? Uh, I showed you that little video of the coral spawn and the polyps landing. I, I, think, I think I'm mic'd up right here, of the coral polyps landing. And so reefs are continuously regenerating. They're a life form. So every year they spawn and they regenerate. So a lot of that damage when a, when a crown of thorns star uh, outbreak passes through or when a cyclone passes through, the reefs immediately start to regenerate and they regrow. And so what you have is you've got periods of damage and then regrowth. And that's a natural process that's been occurring for, for millennia. Death and regrowth, it's life. It's a living organism, it's like anything else. What's changing now is the rapidity and the severity of the bleaching events so that the corals don't have the time to recover. Thank you very much. So the second question, actually combined the second question is, once you are able to use these monitoring systems, to identify areas of risk for coral bleaching, is there anything you can dare to the protection or mitigation of the high temperature induced uh, damages? So those mitigation and also including the adaptation yeah. of the uh, yeah. coral bleaching. Yeah, thanks, great question. I mean, I tried to cover it a little bit at the end of the talk, but look, this is critical. I mentioned the need to mitigate. We've got to get our emissions down because right now the Earth system has such a huge lag in, in how it responds to, um, to the, uh, the effects of anthropogenic global warming that um, even if we stopped emitting uh, carbon now, today, zero, there's still such a lag in the Earth system that we're locked into warming for decades to come. So the challenge for reefs doesn't really go away. They're right on their threshold, that one degree. They're right there. That's what they're telling us. And, and so, yes, we have to start doing uh, human-based interventions wherever we can to understand can we uh, use our understanding of the way water, cool water upwells and moves around the reefs. Can we use our understanding of uh, the fact that, for instance, in the Red Sea, where it's warmer, corals have adapted and evolved over thousands of years to tolerate higher temperatures. So can we take corals and genetic material from, from those corals and transplant them here? Uh, a couple of the very, very well-known reef scientists that I've been speaking to have, have, um, have said that we need to make sure that we have a reef into the future because of all the value that it provides. Whether it'll look like the reefs we've come to know and love, that's still an open question, and it depends on all of us. Thank you. The other way to protect is maybe protect, or what about the artificial plant of the coral, artificial plant or uh, seed repository to keep the species yeah. longer, or artificial planting? Yeah. So I think, I think that's exactly what we're doing is so at Ames and a number of institutions around the world, we're starting to really seriously look at, we're doing aquarium-based studies right now that look at breeding corals. So in our sea simulator, uh, it's the world's only uh, at scale, computer controlled research aquarium. It's actually hundreds of aquariums all connected. 
We're breeding corals. We have seven generations, I think, uh, of families of corals that we've bred in the lab. And we're using them to try to understand how we can go into the environment. And this is some video here of some of the things that we do at, at Ames uh, to try to put those back into the environment. Can we seed coral that we've grown in the lab back in, you no know, native species, can we seed them back into areas that have been damaged to help that recovery go, go more quickly? So there's a, there's a lot of things we can do. That's great. But I'm, I'll stress, and this is part of the reason I brought up replacement, replacement value, is that the cost of doing these things is tremendous. The cost of preserving is a lot cheaper than the cost of fixing. And I think the last category of the question is that uh, not only the researchers or scientists or experts, what can we, maybe as an audience or a society, do to protect the Australia, Australia's uh, greatest national treasure? Curtis from Flinders University, man, great question. Huh? <laughs> Thanks. Um, good on you. Look, again, this is not just Australia, but it's a global, a global thing, so I'll just make it a global generic answer. I think there's, there's lots that we can all do. First is we have to educate ourselves, we have to educate uh, our, uh, the next generation who, who desperately want to be around to see this, and uh, we also need to educate um, our, our decision makers, you know, our, our representatives, uh, members of industry and government, our communities. So there's a big influencing role that we can all play because we're all here in, in, in congresses and meetings like this, we're educated, we, we travel, we know what's going on. And so I think we have a duty as much as a, you know, a responsibility to, uh, to bring that kind of communication out there. Um, and to the degree that we can influence within our own organizations, then I think we have a duty to do that as well. And look, a lot of the people I'm meeting every day, and I'm sure many of you here are doing that on, on an everyday basis as well. I think getting out into the community is really important as well. And uh, you know, there's a lot of citizen science programs that go on around, to, around the world, and getting involved in those is a great way. And of course, talking to our elected politicians and telling them what we want. So thank you very much, Paul. And actually, the time uh, the now we are given is almost the end. But kindly enough, uh, Dr. Hardesty will stay here if you have more questions. And we don't have any other sessions planned after this session. So uh, if you have more questions, please ask questions to Paul. And actually, uh, I had a great honor to moderate uh, this session. And uh, uh, many people ask me, Chiaki, what was the best part of your space flight? What you have learned? And actually, the, uh, after the space flight, I had even more appreciated the natural environment what our home planet is giving to us. So I believe the, ch ch uh, uh, the changes on the Great Barrier Reef teaches us, suggested us, that we have to do something to protect our environment, to ha hand it over, to hand over its beauty to the generations to come. That's what I believe. So thank you very much. Uh, your lecture teaches us the importance. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.